And I'm also going to turn on captions. <clears throat> and I usually start right at noon just to give you the full benefit of the a lot of the long time. That's fine. Yeah, I have a pretty long kind of intro, so if people are late, they'll be able to figure okay. out what's going on. Hey, David. Hey, Trent. How's it going? Good. I've got a new laptop here and a new setup. I'm trying to make sure everything's working. Okay, we're right at noon, so I'll go ahead and get started with introductions. Uh, I'll just mention, as you probably heard as you were coming in, today's session is being recorded. Uh, and we also have captions up. If you would like to disable the captions, you can just click on the CC Live Transcript button at the bottom of your screen to turn those off. Um, and I'll also ask you all to mute. Let's see, so I'm hearing something. Okay. So um, today's, uh, so, sorry, I'll get going now. So today's presentation is by, do by Dr. Trent Alexander, who is Associate Director and Research Professor right here on campus at ICPSR. Uh, he holds a PhD in history from Carnegie Mellon University, and his research focuses on historical demography and large-scale data infrastructures. His published research has appeared in outlets including Demography, American Sociological Review, International Migration Review, and Social Science History. Prior to joining ICPSR in 2017, Dr. Alexander initiated the Census Longitudinal Infrastructure Pro Project at the Census Bureau, which we'll hear more about today. And that's a program to create and document linkages across confidential census, census microdata files and with other administrative records and survey data. Prior to working at the Census Bureau, he was at the University of Minnesota, where he managed IPUMS, the Integrated Public Use Microdata Series. And so I think that one way or another, we as demographers are all probably enormously grateful to Dr. Alexander for his research with IPUMS, with the Census Bureau, and, IC and at ICPSR for the data infrastructure that supports our work. And I'm delighted to have him here today to talk about his own project work and research. Uh, he has graciously agreed to take questions as we go. He'll present for about 35 minutes, but depending on how the Q&A goes to, through this presentation, that may run a little bit longer. Uh, if you have a question, please either use, use the raise your hand icon or uh, post your question in the chat, and we'll pause to take that. Uh, after Dr. Alexander's presentation, we'll have about 10 to 15 minutes for follow-up questions at the end, and then we'll use the remaining 10 to 15 minutes for a professional development conversation with our PSC pre-docs and post-docs. So uh, with that, I will turn things over to Dr. Alexander and thank you again for your presentation today. Thank you for that introduction. And um, thank you to everyone for, for making time during lunch to come hear this. And as Paula said, um, I, please feel free to ask questions during the talk. You know, I, if anything's not clear, I wanna be able to make it clear and um, answer any questions you might have. There should also be time at the end too. Um, I'm going to share my screen here.
So Paula, can you just see, just see. The, the, the first slide? Okay, perfect. So I'm gonna talk about the uh, Dec Decennial Census Digitization and Linkage Project to give you kind of a big picture overview of what this is. Um, this ultimately will be about uh, making a linked data infrastructure for uh, researchers to use, including all the censuses from 1850 through 2020. Um, this truly is big science. There are a lot of people working on this who are not me. Um, the part of this that I focus on is linking the 1960 through 1990 censuses. Um, and I'll tell you about some, some ongoing efforts that have made fully disseminated data from earlier censuses. And the Census Bureau itself conducted the linkages from the 2000 through 2020 censuses. So it's really that, that 1960 to 1990 period I'm focusing on, but this is part of um, what is really gonna, I think be a revolutionary infrastructure for all of social science. Um, and for people who join, if you wouldn't mind muting, I think I can hear one. Um, oh, thanks, thanks. Okay, so what I'm gonna talk about is uh, how I got into it, this. It's kind of a unique field um, to be in right now where it's not, uh, we're disseminating data, but there's also sort of a data rescue component to this and uh, how we conduct our record linkages. I'm gonna provide an example from the 1940 census of exactly how the linkages work. And I'm gonna describe some of the unique challenges we face in adding the 1960 through 1990 censuses. And um, the, some research that's already been done with this data, because a lot of it is already available, and how you get it. And uh, I'm actually going to back up for a second and say that my collaborator on all this work for quite some time has been uh, Katie Genetic, who's an economist at the U.S. Census Bureau, but we go way back, as um, I'll tell you in just a moment. Okay. Um, I started working with census microdata as a graduate student at Carnegie Mellon University in the 1990s. I really did use reel-to-reel -reel tapes that really came from ICPSR. Um, none of the data was linked at this point. This was um, person-level census microdata that had been uh, anonymized. So this is the public use microdata samples. Um, and I'm a historian, so I was trying to use all of them that I could together. That was very hard at that time because they were each was kind of produced on its own terms. So the variables would have different names and the values would have different, would be coded in different ways. And if you wanted to do something like birthplace, where the countries of birth people might report have changed over time, or occupation, where the occupations themselves have changed over time, that presented even sort of higher level challenges for using for doing long-term cross-sectional work with multiple censuses. So I was really engaged with all that work as a graduate student. And um, it was, you know, it was hard. Um, just the computing was hard at that time. And fortunately for me, somewhere around in the middle of graduate school, I became aware of a team at University of Minnesota who were doing this work on a grand scale. That is the work of making it easy to use lots of different census samples uh, together. Um, and this integrated public use microdata series, that was the team. They were doing a great job. It actually made, made my work as a scholar, as trying, trying a budding scholar, trying to write my dissertation a lot easier. It took a lot of what in my first couple of years had been um, really laborious data integration work that I loved, um, but it took it off my plate. It meant that I could rely on work that they had done to make it easier for others to use these data. And I loved what they were doing. I loved how they were doing it. So I went to work there after I got my um, PhD, first as a postdoc and then as a research scientist. And it was a fantastic place to work. And their model of integrating data, integrating data series that are already available but very hard to use often together has been really extensible uh, to a lot of the most important resources in the social sciences. Um, here you can see the current population survey, global health surveys, um, and some other resources that have really benefited from this approach. And um, I'm gonna tell a little bit about a story of how I came to do what I do and how I was influenced by people there. And I'll summarize it for you briefly. And that is surround yourself with smart people who are doing are similar doing. things to you. This is, uh, I learned so much from my colleagues there that have influenced the rest of my career. 
And I'm gonna talk for a moment about IPUMS International. So this is where they did the same thing that I and they had done with the United States censuses for censuses around the world, where they got grants to often rescue the data because it was in danger of uh, uh, de degradation that would make it not useful, and then integrating it and disseminating it freely on the web. Um, this is um, an image of the censuses, the modern censuses from Sudan, where IPMS International uh, got resources from the National Institutes of Health to help the statistical agency there recover these data, and then to anonymize it and disseminate it. Um, and this is, again, this wasn't work I was doing. I was working on the US data, but it was just um, thrilling to be a part of and to um, it influence my, the approach I took to my work on the US data. Um, this is just one of the reels that you had, that you, this was in that room that you just saw a picture of. This is from the Darfur region of Sudan. And all of this data, despite what you, you know, the state that this reel looks to be in and that that room looked to be in was fully recovered. And this is available free on the internet now. Um, this is Bangladesh, and um, you can see here, this is in a sort of a, it's stored properly. This is in a temperature controlled room. It's very organized, but even so, these data needed rescue. This is one of the reels that was in that room. These reels don't last forever. Microfilm doesn't last forever. Um, and this for me, just seeing my colleagues engaging with these kinds of problems really hammered home the point um, that data is fragile and that we have to um, secure it, digitize it and protect it and disseminate it because that's really how you protect it is by sharing it ultimately. So uh, this is uh, this reel I was also fully uh, recovered. Those data are also free on the internet now. So it was this was the kind of the milieu that I was in at uh, University of Minnesota. And it was around um, 2007. At this point, I was a staff member there when uh, we asked the US Census Bureau. So I was a user of the research data centers. Um, many of us were. They had um, just made available data from the 2000 census, restricted microdata. So this was the full 2000 census data, not just the public use data. And it was so exciting. And we uh, requested that they make data from 1960 through 1990 available in the same way. That is the restricted data within the, the RDCs. And they said, well, it's, you know, we, we of course wanna do that, but it's stored on some tapes. It's gonna be hard to recover. Um, they embarked on that effort though. And um, some of it was unrecoverable for the exactly the kinds of problems that you saw before. It was on reel-to-reel -reel tapes and uh, those tapes don't last forever. And they didn't last forever. So the 1960 census in particular, they were unable to recover. So we at Minnesota got a grant from the National Institutes of Health to work in collaboration with the Census Bureau to recover it. And again, this wasn't digital data recovery. The digital data was gone. It, it, it didn't no longer existed, or at least parts of it. There were some of it that was recoverable, but there was enough that wasn't that um, they would not make it available because it was a flawed data file, um, you know, quite sensibly. We didn't disagree with that perspective, but um, we did get this grant to work with them to recover it. And that brought me to this cave in Lenexa, Kansas. This is a National Archives managed cave. Um, they have a couple of these. They also have one in Boyers, Pennsylvania. It's formerly a mine, a limestone mine. So you can see the walls are square. You know, it's an unfinished cave in large part, but the walls are square, the ceiling is standard height because it was mined. Um, this is acres and acres and acres where all kinds of federal records are stored, including the microfilm that the original manuscripts of the 1960 census were on. So we worked in this cave to um, scan several thousand microfilm reels. This was the operation. We had one scanner that on the left-hand side of that image, you can see is unfinished cave wall. Um, on the right-hand side is all of the um, sort of the technical infrastructure that supported the work. But this was scanning a couple of thousand microfilm reels. The 1960 census was the first one that was meant to be digitized from the start. So it's a bubble form, you know, like a Scantron. So we used optical mark recognition to recover the data from the bubbles. We restored the full internal microdata file and released that's now available in the FSRDCs. And we made new public use microdata that's available now publicly as well. 
So that was my sort of entry into this work. My motivation was from MIPMS International, um, but that sort of, this has guided my career to this day. I mean, just the idea that data is fragile, it needs to be recovered and protected and shared. Um, it all started in this cave for me. Um, shortly after that project, I went to the Census Bureau and uh, more recently, Katie herself has gone to the Census Bureau. And of course, I'm, I've been at ICPSR for the past three years. So we continue to work on this project together just in our locations have changed. So here's where we are with linked census data. Um, from eight, the Census Bureau keeps data private. It's confidential for 72 years from the date of the census. That means that the census of 1940 was made public in 2012. That's the most recent one. So everything from 1940 back is public. They've been digitized through the very hard work of people um, at the University of Minnesota, at familysearch.org and ancestry.com. They've all uh, worked uh, in different ways, worked together to digitize, link, and disseminate this data. Uh, there are two large bodies of data from 1850 to 1940 that are linked and available to the public. You could go get them yourself now. Uh, one is through IPMS, it's called the IPMS Linked Samples. The other is done by a different research team at the National Bureau of Economic Research. It's called the NBER Census Linking Project. So these are out there, they're free for the taking, um, and they're both getting better all the time. Both teams continue to um, improve the quality of the links, but even just as importantly, the coverage of the links. The problem, one problem, with these pre-1950 linkages from my perspective is that most records aren't linked. These are, um, it's very hard to do these links because there are limited linkage keys. You typically will just have name and that might just be first initial, last name, uh, age and place of birth, usually like a state um, or country. So there are a lot of non-unique people when you try to use only those linkage keys. And therefore, a lot of cases that just can't be linked. Um, now, these teams are sort of brilliant in their efforts to figure out how to bring more data into the equation to understand more about who these people are and to facilitate higher rates of linkage. But right now, you know, anything, anything from 10 to 40 percent of the linkage rate from one census to another is considered uh, good during that period, the pre-1940 period. Um, now, the other large body of linked data that's already available is from 2000, the modern censuses, 2000, 2010, soon to be 2020, and the American Community Survey. This is work that the Census Bureau has done um, in support of its own um, sort of mandates and, and own research efforts that I can talk more about if people want. And a big difference between this, these modern, there are two big differences between these modern linkages and the older ones. One is their linkage rates are extraordinarily high uh, for the modern data, more like 90%. And um, that's largely due to that these are much higher quality data. We have better linkage keys. We have full date of birth, for instance, and they have other um, some other stuff that I'll get into in just a minute that make it much, much more effective in terms of their linkage quality and coverage. Um, and also it's restricted data because it's not 72 years old yet. So you can only use this data in the RDCs. So that's what's out there until a couple of years ago, that's all that there was. Um, now, a research team that I was a part of brought in the 1940 census that again had been digitized by these external groups. Um, they uh, made it available to us under a research contract that we and we brought that in to the Census Bureau and linked it forward to the modern censuses. So that was the first connection between these two um, infrastructures that were otherwise completely disconnected. And the project Katie and I are doing that I'm going to talk about in more detail today is to fill in that gap. 1960, 70, 80, and 90. Those are the, that's the part of the infrastructure that's not there yet. Um, it's really hard to bring in that we have some, um, that we have plans to do. Okay, any questions yet? All right. I will talk briefly about how we're going to link this data. Uh, record linkage is, is really critical to the work of the Census Bureau. It's not, um, 
something they do on the side or something they do just for researchers. It's sort of core to their DNA. Um, it's part of their law, Title 13, that they are, uh, that the director of the Census Bureau is required to call on other units of the government or to call on states. When there is data that they could acquire that would reduce burden on the public who the Census Bureau otherwise asks questions of, they are mandated to try to get that data, to try to make it so that through record linkage, if there are questions they don't have to ask because the government already has the data. The Census Bureau is commanded to go get that data and do their best to, through, often through record linkage, uh, reduce the burden on respondents. And the truth is they use a lot of this data, not just because there's some question that they won't have to ask, but they use it to make their surveys more efficient. The most common, the most powerful example for them is the frame of addresses that they actually survey in the census. This is built um, in part with support of administrative records from the Postal Service and from the other agencies of the government. So the government beyond the Census Bureau already knows a great deal about where people live and who lives there. The Census Bureau uses this data to build their frames to figure out who they're going to contact. So this is a really critical part of who they are. Um, and that makes this, this work uh, function, the project that I'm describing. This is, I'm not gonna read through this, but this is some examples of data that they hold because of the, the um, requirement in that rule that I just showed you, the law that I just showed you. This is data they've acquired to improve um, their own frames of addresses and to improve surveys whenever they can. So all of this, most of this is, is linked to the infrastructure. how they do their production record linkage. They of course have a lot of smart people doing linkage in all kinds of ways, but the most common way that they link any file that comes in is they link it to a composite of everything that they already hold, okay, from the rest of the government. They uh, like, their record linkage techniques are pretty standard. They use name, date of birth, sex, state or country of birth, and street address. So these are, they can use a lot of linkage keys and they will link to this composite um, whenever they can link a record to the composite of administrative records that they hold. They assign it something called a protected identification key or a PIC. And any record that has been assigned, any data set that has been assigned PICs through linkage to this composite can be matched to any other data set that has been assigned PICs. Okay, so that's, it's a really powerful approach to linkage. Um, everything is sort of automatically pre-linked to everything else as soon as you do this main match to the composite. And you can see the rates of linkage. This is a really successful approach in the 2000 census. 89% of the records were successfully assigned a PIC in this way. 2010, it's about 91%. And the American Community Survey, which is an annual, large annual survey, it's over 90% of the records are assigned PICs. They're successfully linked to the uh, composite. So the coverage is good because it's, you know, 90% of the records are linked, but there's still bias here um, because the composite is based on administrative records, tax data, Medicare data, Medicaid data, HUD data, basically people who have interacted with the government. That is who is in the composite. That means we're really good at assigning links to people who pay taxes, people who have jobs, people on Medicare, anyone who's received assistance from the government. Not as good at mobile populations, transient populations, people without social security numbers and children who aren't claimed on tax forms. Um, that's mostly how you, a child gets into the composite is that they're on a tax form. So that 90% is great, but the people who are in that 10% of unlinked people, they're often in these harder to assign categories. So there is bias in, this, in these linkages. Um, that bias also has a geographic component. So this, um, this is some work that uh, Amy O'Hara and Sonia Porter did after the 2010 census where they linked the, um, the 2010 census to all of the administrative records held at the Census Bureau at that time to the composite. And they essentially said, who in the census did we already know about? 
what addresses and what people was the government already aware of? And the purple and blue counties, most of the people, the vast majority, the government already knew about, the Census Bureau already knew about because they were in administrative records. The green and yellow that you see across the Southwest, uh, largely, much higher percentages, you know, close to 20% in some counties, the government didn't know about them until the Census Bureau showed up to count them. So coverage was really bad of administrative records in those areas, okay, because of the kinds of um, bias I was talking about before. This is, there are more hard to, um, mobile populations, transient populations, populations without SSNs, um, people who didn't file tax forms, uh, people who didn't speak English well. So that's how the geographic bias, you know, it's still 90% linkage rate, but the 10%, a lot more of it lived in the areas that are orange and yellow here, okay? Are they accurate? So we got 90%, that's only good if they're actually accurate. Um, what I can say, I, and I'm personally very confident about this, is that these are accurate links. Um, this, the, the best research on this, and there needs to be more for sure, is an experiment that was done with the 2000 and 2010 censuses. Um, I, I'm, I'm sorry, an experiment that was done with the uh, Medicare data, which has the same variables as the 2000 and 2010 censuses, date of birth address, um, sex, name, and it also has very high quality social security numbers. So the researchers took that data, stripped SSNs, and treated it like 2000 and 2010 census data, matched it to the composite, and then asked, did these matches work? Using social security number as sort of the truth of the, of the data. And they did, they very much did. Um, so I'm happy to talk about this more later on, but this is probably the most important study of the quality of these data that exist. Um, we, for the 2000 on, uh, you know, I think most researchers who've used these data have been convinced of their quality. For the earlier censuses though, we're gonna have less information to do our linkage. Quality will be more of a challenge and uh, just assessing quality. And finding a truth deck is always really hard in linkage studies. So we have a couple of ideas on how we're gonna assess quality for that older data. One is gonna to be to use the panel study of income dynamics as a truth deck. Because this is of course a study where roughly around the years of each census, uh, the University of Michigan survey team sat down with people and, and asked them questions about themselves. We know who these people are and where they lived at each census. This really is a, a longitudinal truth deck. Um, we will take those people's records, making them look just like a census record, giving us the information the census has and ask ourselves uh, and, and pick them and say, did we get them right? Did we figure out who they were and where they lived? Um, so this I think is kind of the ultimate truth deck. Um, and we have another experiment where we'll use the 2000 census much like a truth deck where we'll, we'll dumb it down so that it looks like the earlier censuses redo the picks and ask how often the picks remain the same. So that'll give us sort of a sense of the error um, that is created by having less information about the historical records. So those are some ideas we have uh, about current accuracy and the challenges to assessing accuracy for the earlier uh, data. And I'm gonna tell you a, a little bit now about how we add the 1940 census. I think that'll give you a sense of, of kind of the challenge of this old, that the older data presents. Any questions? Okay. So I told you we brought 1940 and linked it forward. Uh, we got the data from IPUMS who had gotten it from a collaboration with ancestry.com and familysearch.org. We could have a lot of the, uh, we could have just linked one census to the other using variables they have in common. This is often what um, people linking the 1850 through 1940 censuses are doing. They're taking what's in common and linking file to file. Um, if we had done that, I think we would have gotten about 2 million links between, you know, these are gigantic files. You can see the ends there. 
we only would have successfully linked, I think, about 2 million, and we would have had almost no women because when they change their name, we lose them. Um, so that would have been bad. And I'm, so what I'm gonna show you now is sort of the, the power of the composite approach. Linking to the composite, we just have a lot more variables to work with. Um, we have alternate names in the composite. Um, we have age, sex, and state or country of birth. And really importantly, we have parents' names. And just to tell you where this comes from, when, when you or your parents apply for a social security card, um, the parents' names are listed on that card um, or, or on that application. And we also have that information for children in the 1940 census because they lived with their parents. So this provides, you know, th these are really high quality linkage keys and it's a lot of linkage keys. So this is a much better way to, to link than just using those variables that the two censuses have in common. So it, with this approach, we linked 54 million records from the 1940 census to the composite. The record, the linkage was much more common for young people than for old people for the reason I just explained, because we have we, parents' names are a really powerful linkage key. We have parents' names for young people. The 2000 census, we did the same thing. We have alternate names. Uh, the Census Bureau did this work. This wasn't Katie and me, this was already done. Um, they had alternate names. They had place of residence and also had place of residence in the same year um, tax returns. Um, so this was a really powerful source of linkage and they linked 249 million of those 282 million records. So again, to summarize here, whereas we might've just gotten 2 million links if we had linked the censuses directly and they would have been almost all men, linking through the composite, we ended up with 26 million links. And if every link had been successful, that is if everyone in 2000 who we know was present in the United States in 1940 had been successfully linked, we would have expected 41 million. So this is a pretty, for such old data, this is a pretty extraordinary uh, linkage rate. That is 26 million out of 41 million potential links. Okay, so adding the- Trent, Trent yep. can I ask a question? Sure, Boy Blakely. Yep. Um, so if you, if you took the leftovers from that, that is to say the people who didn't go through the composite file, what do they look like? Do, do they look like all false positives because of blanks or something? Or, or do you recover anything else? That's a great question. If we looked at the leftovers, um, hang on, I'm going to go back. It's the people on the outer bars here. So yeah. the, the middle of this is the ones we linked. The outside of this is the ones we didn't. So you can see it's pretty equal numbers of men and women. It's mostly older men and women. Um, is that the kind of thing you're you're talking about? Um, well, I was so some of these are kind of obvious because like the life table. If you if you pulled the life table out, you'd expect the seven. As I understand it, that you'd be missing a lot of seventy year olds, nineteen forty seventy year olds anyway, right? Um, in fact, almost all of those. I would guess there's there's. I'm surprised you find anybody. <laughs> uh, but I meant more, even the people that are in the highly easy to, relatively easy to match groups, say the children. Right. What are the characteristics of those that you fail to match? And yeah, I see. What, what, if you, what if you tried, if you looked at them directly, for example, would there be ones that might pop up? Yeah, well, okay, so just to be clear here, this is not linked to the 2000 census. This is linked to the composite. And to be, you know, so this, a 70 year old who got a social security number before they died, um, is in the composite. So they didn't have to live for another 60 years to get linked by us. Um, they just have to show up in government records somewhere. Um, but yeah. Trent, does the, does the, how does this deal with the name issue? Like how are you, why does matching to social security have such a high, I guess I'm not quite sure I understand why that has such a high payoff for, for those sort of, sure. for, the, the... for the John Smiths of the world. Yeah, that's fair. Um, it has a, okay, for women, it has a payoff because Social Security knows um, their alternate names. Yeah. For men, it has a payoff, even for men with common names, because we also have their parents' names. So if John Smith's father is also John and John Smith's mother is Jane, it's not going to help us that much. But that's often not the case. 
So the having the three different first names as a as a linkage key helps a lot. Yeah. Okay. okay. And Hoyt, I, I don't have I don't have a great answer on the top of my head to your to your question. We certainly have the data and could do more research on the people who aren't linked, um, especially among those kids where the linkage rates are otherwise high. But I don't actually have a quick way to characterize that for you. But you could look at things like you did with your map of state and part of the country and yep. some of those things at least. Yep. Yep. I mean, all the data is there. We know a lot about the people who we didn't link because we have their complete 1940 census record. Yep. Well, I've looked at this historically and, and there, there's sort of different categories of people you can't find. They're the ones that you really can find, but you, you can't determine whether they are the 45th John Smith that you see or the 217th, right? Um, and then they're the ones that don't match to anyone. Um, so that, that would be another sort of characterization there of, of what drives the linkage failure. But, but I, I think David, the thing that David was uh, in, uh, alluding to is, as well as the selection aspect of this. You know, Definitely. who doesn't show up by, ver by geography, by, and in 40, you have all these parental characteristics like income and occupation and so forth. And so you can ask, you know, who, who are we missing uh, by that virtue? Absolutely. Yep. Good point. Um, Can I ask, just since in this audience here has a, a lot of knowledge of data sets, um, back to your, what would you call it, the truth deck? Right? Um, yeah. What, what are the sort of, it seems like the, there are a lot of sort of smaller data sets that are, uh, that I can sort of come up with the top of my head that might be useful for this, like the term and, the Terman survey of high IQ youth that tra tracks them over the 20th century, or the um, what's the one um, that was the um, veterans, Air Force veterans of World War II. Um, I forget what I forget the name of it, but anyway, there there are a bunch of surveys like that. So you know, it, it strikes me that those might actually also be useful for this for this project because they would fill in earlier earlier areas. Um, yeah. Well, I want to hear about them. I mean. Tell me <laughs> later, at least. Sure, uh, sure. Yeah, because I we need more truth decks. This is always, I mean, for, in the historical data, so the 1850 to 1940, as, as you probably know, the truth deck is often the data that was linked by hand. And I'm really uncomfortable with that. I don't know why we trust that data more than data linked by a computer, but we do. Um, so I like truth decks like the PSID or perhaps like the surveys you're describing, where someone sat there with the person at different points in time and interviewed them and we can confirm that that is the same person at different points, more than just an expert looked at the census record and believes it's a good link. Um, not as comfortable with that approach. Well, I'm a partisan of the Union Army project, the Union Army data, but you know that's another example, right? Where it, the, the linkage rates there, the tracking rates are absurdly high in part because the government was sending these people checks. And so they wanted to be, they wanted to be visible uh, yep. and have their addresses and so forth. And so anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll try to come up with the list. Yeah, no, that'd be great. And that's the beauty of, from the Census Bureau's perspective, Medicare as a truth deck. Those Medicare records are good because people want their Medicare check right. um, or their Medicare benefit rather. Um, okay, I'll try to move a little quicker. 1960 through 1990. Um, these are a little harder than some other years. We have complete microdata files, but they don't have names. I described this as a, the 1960 as a Scantron form. That's what all these are. The Census Bureau didn't recover names because they didn't need to, and it's very expensive. So we're recovering the names. Um, they're handwritten by all the respondents. They're currently stored on 250,000 microfilm reels, and they're highly restricted. So all these things create new problems in terms of data recovery and uh, linkage. And this is where the, we did a pilot on 1990. This is where all the reels are stored. What you're looking at there is 250,000 microfilm reels uh, stored in cabinets that contain the original census manuscripts. This is what the 1990 census looks like. That's my handwriting at the top. It's not a real record, um, but that's the problem. We are trying to recover all those names. So first we're digitizing then we're doing handwriting recognition on the names. And we also have to recover, if you see it below person two, there's a um, identifier that allows us to link those names back to the microdata that we already have. 
you can just see how the name fields occurred in different censuses. Um, 1940 certainly would, would be worse for this because it's not segmented by first and last name. But by 2020, you can see it's letter segmentation because they're fully prepared to do uh, handwriting recognition on those forms. We compared a couple of microfilm readers to see if the quality of the microfilm varied for our purpose. We made a big truth deck where we typed in the answers to, we typed in people's names and we typed them in twice. And when they were, they were different, we adjudicated why they were different. So we have a very, very solid truth deck for what the answer to the handwriting should be, what the correct name is. And we worked with two different teams who specialize in handwriting recognition um, work. And they worked for this pilot in the basement of the Census Bureau. They had to bring in their own uh, servers and work in, on quarantine machines. And uh, one of them was quite successful. So I'm gonna just really quickly show you how often their OCR matched the, the double entered ground truth. For age, we did that kind of as a test. There's a handwritten age on the 1990 census form. They got that right 95% of the time. Last name, they got exactly right, letter for letter, 82% of the time. First name, exactly right, letter for letter, 75% of the time. And for record linkage, you don't need it to be exact. What you need is for it to be close. And I've defined what I mean by close here. They were close about 90% of the time. That is, this is automated handwriting recognition was uh, similar enough for record linkage to the truth data 90% of the time. And when it wasn't close enough, there's a quality measure that pretty much always tells us it wasn't close. So we're not having to sort of wonder, was this a good one or not? They usually know. The handwriting recognition experts usually know when they're not getting a good measure. So that was our pilot um, that we've used to sort of seek for funding for this further work, which we have recently gotten the funding. So we are now beginning the, the, the whole thing from 1960 through 1990. And um, I wanna just take a couple of minutes and talk about research that's been done with this linked data already, because it, it is already, uh, a lot of it's already available. So this is work um, that researchers at the Census Bureau in Minnesota did, where they looked at linked 2020 10 census data and asked when race responses changed. That is when an individual changed their race response. And um, this was just really great work and I recommend it. It was published in Demography. They've had a couple of other articles since then looking at individual race response changes. Um, who does it? What type of environment do they live in? Family situation um, and what race uh, is, is in Hispanic status is most likely to change. Um, my research team, I study the Great Migration, and we used the linked 1940 and 2000 data to uh, look at uh, long-term outcomes in the Great Migration. That is not for the migrants themselves, but with their children. We observed those who made the Great Migration uh, in 1940, living in the North and West. They, for the most part, did have children living in their households, and we followed those children forward to 2000 to see long-term outcomes in the Great Migration. And just as importantly, uh, we had a comparison group of uh, African-Americans who did not make the Great Migration and who remained in the South, how their children's long-term outcomes, um, just in terms of, of, of things like income and poverty status and home ownership and rates of education, um, how the, those, the children of those who migrated compared to the children of those who didn't migrate. And that's just work that um, there's no other way to do before you have this large scale linked data. Uh, people are definitely using this data to study inequality. This is a working paper that uh, people inside and outside the Census Bureau did together where they brought in linked census data from prior to 1940 and linked it into this infrastructure. So that's where we see, that, you know, the real power of this infrastructure is going to be, I think, in what, not just in the use of the linked census data, but in bringing in other stuff that you link to this. Uh, to enhance the value of that other stuff. And that's what they've done. They've linked it back in time. This, um, I don't know if uh, this Raj Chetty and his group at, um, at Opportunity Insights at Harvard worked with census researchers to create something called the Opportunity Atlas, where they um, followed, they identified people in tax data 
from the early 1990s. That's the earliest tax data we have that identifies the children living with uh, their parents or their tax dependents living with their parents. And they followed those tax dependents forward in time, those children forward in time and compared um, long-term outcomes. So, you know, they're in their 30s now for the most part. Um, and looked at where, what type of person and from what type of area social mobility was most common. And this wasn't just a tax data project. You really need, they needed linked census data to make this work. Tax data don't tell you the race of the uh, tax filers, uh, education. Um, they also looked at incarceration as an outcome. These are all things you get from the census data. Okay, so this was a linkage of tax and census data, much like the last project I described, where they, the census data is providing um, much more breadth than uh, you have in the data that you're bringing in and uh, made this research possible. Okay, so you can get all, you can get a lot of this already in federal statistical research data centers. This is just a map of where those are. We have one here in Ann Arbor. This is a list of what's available and what's not. Basically it all is, except for the part that says coming soon there from 1960 through 1990. Uh, Katie and I wrote a working paper on the methods that we're going to use to link 1960 through 1990. That work is underway. We, um, the Census Bureau recently bought uh, 25 scanners, microfilm scanners that will be uh, operated by uh, staff in Jeffersonville, Indiana at the Census Bureau office there. And within five years, this is the infrastructure we imagine where all the censuses will be linked. That's what I've got across the top there. And it'll be easy to bring other valuable data into this infrastructure, like major federal surveys and administrative records and user provided data. So that's the, the long-term vision here. And that is what I have. Well, thank you, Trent. That was terrific. And it's just thrilling to think about having this, uh, these many data resources already available and this incredibly impressive work that's yet to come. Um, do we have any questions? And we have Sarah's observation that you have remarkably good handwriting in the chat. Any questions? Uh, I have one follow up. I think this was, I, I, I think this, you said this, but. Just to be clear, so all this amazing data that's going to be available in five years, it the plan is that'll be available through the through the federal research data centers, or will there be other ways as well? Or is that is that is that plan A? Yeah, it'll be available through the FSRDCs um, and uh, the metadata. Of, you know, full variable level metadata will be here at ICPSR. It'll be documented so you can see what's there and and uh, whether or not it's going to be useful to you um, over time. So in 2032, the 1960 data will become public, right? And so over time, it'll all be public, just like the 19, uh, 1850 through 1940 is now. George? Hi, hi Trent. This is, uh, this is really great work. Um, I did have two questions for you uh, about you know, the, the way that the census Bureau of stuff works. One of them is about uh, what they think of a pick as. So is, do they think of a pick as an actual person where, they, where that number always points to the same person or is it a more complicated one? My second question was, um, you know, linking to the, the Do you have a question? Linking to the social yes. security and um, are you going somewhere? <laughs> Hi, Lisa. Um, and <laughs> linking to the social yes. security and other things. My impression is that uh, social, you know, that not everybody was eligible for social security at, at the beginning, and I wonder if if you've got a, a sense of how that might be selecting people from 1940 in terms of when different occupations like farmers become eligible and things like that. But all right, thanks. Sure, um, your first question about is a pick a person? It is, um, 
until pretty recently, a pick was not just a person, it was a person who had a social security number. So we would only pick people who had SSNs. That is not the case anymore. Um, there are a couple of different ways people come into the composite, even when they don't have SSNs. But yes, a pick is a person. Um, your second question about, I mean, you're quite right that the, the for, so for the historical data, the foundation of the composite is the social security number system. I mean, it really is. Um, and not everyone got one, not everyone needed to get one. And even some people who needed to get one, you know, perhaps found ways not to do so. Um, we don't need you to have been eligible at the start. We just need you to have been eligible at some point during your life. And uh, I believe the vast majority of the population um, did become so by the mid 60s, by the dawn of Medicare, basically. Um, there are a couple of exceptions like federal employees were some of the last, um, but it, if that makes sense. So it's true that at the start in 1937, many, many, many people were not covered by the program and were not expected to get SSNs. Um, but over time, almost all of them were. So you needed to live long enough to become covered. If you didn't, then you're right. We're gonna have much less luck linking you. So we have a couple of questions through chat and a couple of raised hands. I'm gonna to try to take them in the order they've come in. So first two questions from the chat. And I think the first one may be something you've just roughly addressed and that's roughly what share of picks include SSN information. And then the second is how much of this work is being done by means of machine learning. Yeah. Um, well, this probabilistic record linkage um, where we are, are going through sort of a series, we're using blocking, it's very standard record linkage. So I wouldn't, um, the Census Bureau is working on this, but at the time, I, I, currently I would not characterize it as a machine learning approach. This is, um, we're going through modules that try to link using different, privileging different blocking strategies. Okay. okay. So then um, we'll take questions in order from Hoyt, from Charlotte Cavale, and then from Lisa Dillon. Hoyt? Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, this is really, really interesting. I have one question is a little unfair. It's more where should, who should I talk to, which is in terms of international comparisons. Um, I, I'm just, are there any evidence that potentially in Europe, some of the new privacy laws are making some of these linkages impossible? My experience in France is that a lot of the identifiers across administrative data sets have been destroyed for privacy reasons. So I was wondering who I should talk to for that kind of stuff. My second question is kind of piggybacking on a previous one. I remember a paper by an economist at Minnesota that used social security data to kind of assess the number of missing people that just never show up in our data sets. And his conclusion was pretty dramatic that there's a good chunk of the populations we never see. And so our denominator is wrong. Is there a way to use that, your, the type of data you're playing with and these linkages uh, exercises to actually kind of a backdoor entry to try and understand how many people were missing? Yeah. Um... So we do have an article on, on the work we, on what we did to make the 1940 census. And that's, we did kind of what you're describing instead of what Hoyt is describing where, and of course we should have done both, but you know, hindsight, we, um, we didn't look at who we failed to link in 1940. We looked at who was in the social security data, who we should have been able to link, who we didn't. That is just what you're saying. Social security people who weren't in the census. Uh, or who we hadn't linked back to the census successfully. Um, so yeah, that's possible. There's definitely a lot of meat there. In terms of your other question about privacy and sort of the privacy implications of this data, that is of course a great concern um, for us, for anyone doing this kind of work, making longitudinal resources. Um, we, in a sense, we're fortunate to be working under the umbrella of the Census Bureau for this work. They um, it's their mandate to collect data on people and to link it and to improve um, the quality of the data through linkage. They are one of uh, two agencies that um, have an exemption to the, um, the um, part of the Privacy Act that requires that respondents consent for their data to be linked. So they and the National Archives, there are maybe 15 exceptions to that rule, but agency level exceptions are the Census Bureau and the National Archives. So I don't think that um, respondent privacy or respondent uh, desire to opt out of the linkage 
um, is, is a factor for this infrastructure because we are linking census data and because it's been uh, deemed to be that important that it um, has an exception to the Privacy Act. Hi, thanks. Um, so Trent, this is perhaps inviting you to engage in a little speculation here, but suppose um, I'm down in some basement somewhere and I find a shoebox and it's full with, filled with a sample from some intervention or some measurement or some, some fascinating thing, right? Of a thousand people or 500 people. Um, tell me what is the, and then I decided it'd be really great to find these people, you know, down the line. What, what does the process look like um, once, you know, what next? You see my question. Yeah, I, I get it. Um, <clears throat> here's the process right now. If you wanted to bring that data into this infrastructure, and um, the, you would need to talk to your local research uh, data center administrator, mm -hmm. have an approved project, which takes a little time and takes a little work. Um, the Census Bureau would need to conduct the, rink, the linkage of your records into this infrastructure. That costs money. I think how much money it costs depends on you know, how hard they judge it's going to be. But a, a rule of thumb at the moment, I believe, is $30,000. So uh, it, this is not cheap or easy right now, but that is how it works, that any researcher can bring in data into this in infrastructure, and that's how. Okay, and typically they need name, they need the stuff that I've talked about, name, age, birthplace. If you had date of birth, they'd be thrilled. If you had place of birth, they'd be thrilled. If you have SSN, it's super easy, but they almost never have that, and um, so that's, that's the process. Great. Lisa Dillon. Um, I hi Trent. I uh, this is really great stuff, and I wish Canada was as far along uh, with the uh, mm. researcher census collaboration with the inter modern day intercensal linkages. That uh, I I think there's pathways for that to happen, though. Um, I missed if your composite data includes vital event information. Maybe you said that on a slide, but do you have births, marriages, deaths? Um, we don't have birth records or marriage records. Um, what we do have is Social Security Administration records, which um, typically do have a date of birth. And this is a really weird answer. I'm sorry. They typically have a date of birth and a date of death. Okay. And we know that you got married if you changed your name. So they're not, it's, this is not data from our vital records systems, which in the U.S. it's quite convoluted, as you may know. Yeah. But um, we do have dates of birth and death from the Social Security data. Okay. And we can so infer to, marriage. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And then I, the other comment was more of a blue sky. It would be really cool with this sort of information to also eventually look at people who moved across borders, uh, who, who came in or, or left. And as an example, when I was studying in Minnesota, I had a Social Security number. And I'm about to go back to the US for a sabbatical. And at some point I'll probably use, I was asked in one form for a social security number. I actually have one, even though I'm not American. So I wonder how many times non-Americans have one and it pops up on a form, even though- they I wonder too. I mean, if you took, you could easily be surveyed when you come back as part of the American Community Survey or current population survey. If you did and you have an SSN, we would, you would be part of the linked infrastructure. So that, yeah, I haven't really thought about that, but. That's interesting. Okay, thanks. Now we had one more question with, through the chat. I, are the 1960 to 1990 censuses being linked to 1940 and 2000 via the PICS composite approach that you described for the other linkages? Yes, we, um, we're using the same foundational infrastructure that they used to do the modern stuff. For 1940, we had to modify it um, you know, pretty significantly to take advantage of some that other information that I described. Um, but yeah, we're going to be using the same infrastructure and the data will have picks. Okay, well, I think those are about all the questions that we got. So that leaves us in, a, I think that's good timing for transitioning to our conversation with the PSC postdoc and pre-doc trainees. So I think we'll wrap up here. Thank you, Trent. Yep, thanks everybody.
Mm, lots of thanks and praise coming in through the chat. So I'll be sure to send you the chat uh, transcript. Okay. Okay, so Trent, as I think I mentioned over email, our uh, trainee group includes pre doc students from sociology, economics, and health behavior and health education in the public health school. And our postdocs are from similar, similarly aligned disciplines. And we'd just like to use this time for our trainees to get a chance to chat with you and ask some questions about your, your um, graduate school experience and your own career development. So I'll turn it over to them to. Um, introduce themselves as they have questions. I have a question. Um, thank you so much for your talk. And I love to see all the pictures of the data in the, <laughs> in the cubes. Um, you said that you had worked at IPOMS and now you're in ICPSR. And I was just wondering like what kind of work there is for demographers or social science PhDs like in those environments? Is it mostly these data intensive roles? Um, or I'm just a little curious about what that what that environment is like. Yeah, well, I think um, it's slightly different. At, at IPMs, they directly hire quite a few graduate students. So they, you know, a, a lot of the workforce is graduate students in social sciences. Um, both they and we have uh, postdocs as well. And I'm actually gonna be hiring a postdoc to work on this project within the next year or so. Um, but what at ICPSR in particular, we don't have many um, graduate student research assistants. Um, but that's, so I went to Minnesota as a postdoc and I was a historian. So I was not affiliated with the population center. You know, I went to Carnegie Mellon, they didn't have a population center and I wasn't part of the sort of a trainee program. Um, and at Minnesota, the, and I believe this is probably still true, the, the postdocs there do a lot of direct work on the projects. So it's not like a research postdoc in the sense where you're gonna be doing your own work for most of the time. You're probably gonna be working on data development projects for half or more of your time and then carving out that extra uh, you know, 25 to 50% for independent research that hopefully uses that data because then you're leveraging what you've learned. Um, and that's, I sort of gathered in my time at Minnesota, I don't know if you all have different experiences or knowledge of people who've done this, but that might be somewhat unusual. Um, but for me, I like that you're working hard on a project that isn't yours for a part of your postdoc. Um, I loved it. It got me experiences that there would have been no other way to get. But um, you know, it's not it's not for everyone in that sense. I guess is what I'm saying. Maybe I can follow up on that, and maybe this was what Jane was getting at. Um, what about like once you have a PhD, the sort of career trajectories within those um, environments that are they aren't really alternative to an academic career, but they are not a sort of standard tenure track um, trajectory that a lot of us imagine. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, my whole career has been like that where it's felt not quite academic. Um, and I don't know, I I really like it. And in, I think there are tons of opportunities. So I, yeah, I, maybe I misunderstood. Um, there definitely are grad RA and postdoc opportunities, but in terms of careers, um, we have a lot of people with PhDs who are doing really great work at ICPSR who aren't professors. Um, the same is absolutely true at the Census Bureau um, and it's similar to what I was describing about a postdoc position at Minnesota, whereas you're meaning that you're working on a census survey with a lot of your time. And you're also doing research, but that's a secondary. I would say business is booming. I mean, at ICPSR, at Minnesota, at the Census Bureau, at a lot of other federal agencies for PhDs to get employment and have research be a part of their job, but not the whole job. And honestly, when I compare my sort of day-to-day -day experiences to people uh, who I went to grad school with in academic jobs, they're not actually doing more research than I am. Like, I don't mean to say I'm super productive, but I mean, in terms of time management, they don't have much more time to do research than I do. It's just how you want to spend that the rest of your time. Do you want, you know, if you want to teach, um, you're not going to teach at the Census Bureau. You're probably not going to teach at ICPSR much. 
Um, so that's one thing. But if really you're research focused, you should totally be open to those other careers because there's a huge body of work in any job that you're going to have to do that's not research, even an academic job like teaching and committee work and um, you know all kinds of things that. Um, and it's really what you want that other, that residual of work, that non-research work to be. And I really like, I don't know, I, I liked working for the government. I like working at ICPSR. I like having a big part of my job that's office work, um, you know, where I'm working with other people on the problems they're having. And it's not teaching and it's not being on academic committees, but um, it's pretty rewarding. That's really helpful, thank you. Anything else? I was going to ask, um, you mentioned that you published a paper on methods that you're using for linkages. I'm wondering if there's any other um, topics that you publish on that aren't maybe directly related to methods. Yeah, so I'm a historian of migration and um, I think most of my research that's not methods has been on the great migration uh, that is of African Americans from the South to the North and West in the 20th century. So I study internal migration. Um, I've even before I had link, you know, access to linked data, I was studying migration in different ways, like um, from the South or from Appalachia. So I was a demographer before I was a record linkage person. Um, yeah, that's kind of my research passion. It's a pretty narrow band of my effort right now, but that actually suits me. I don't think I'd want to have spend all my time doing that. Yeah, so that, that's sort of why I asked. So I'm wondering um, if there's anything related to the census. I know it's very, it's sometimes difficult to public, uh, publish on data that are private, like the data that you're analyzing and working with. But if you did want to maybe transition from um, a career at census to academia someday and being able to continually publish would be an important part of that. So th that's my question is how, how easy it is to maybe transition back to academia from census. Oh, I see. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting being at the Census Bureau, you probably have less time to publish than, than people in academia, but the access to data is so privileged. I mean, there's data there that, you, you know, you can really make your career on using data that it's very hard to get for other people, but it's, it's easy to get there. And um, I mean, I'll be honest, it's been, I've worked hard to maintain relationships with people I had there so that I could maintain that access. And for me, for someone who doesn't have tons of time to do research, that's pretty important that I maintain access to that restricted data. So I've had to take a really practical approach to, um, you know, doing more than my share on the articles and making myself useful because um, there are certainly a lot of resources that it's much harder to get outside the government than inside. But being there made me like aware of those. So it, 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 it feels like an advantage that I've tried to maintain since being, a, since being in the government. Thank you. Mm There's one question I have is what advice you might have for people, for researchers outside of the Census Bureau for accessing the data that are available to external researchers. There's still a high bar even for the things that are available in terms of you know the kinds of resources you were describing in terms of the price of linkages if you want to bring data in. I think also yeah. developing professional networks of people inside the Bureau who can become your collaborators on those projects. So uh, is there any generalizable advice for yeah, yeah. Dieting your way in. Yeah, a lot of agencies have restricted data. You know, before the meeting, Paula and I were talking about um, the National Center for Health Statistics, and the IRS has its own linked data program or, or its own uh, restricted data program. Um, in all of those cases, there are ways for external people to get data. They are hard. They take a long time. They have all kinds of weird restrictions on them. Um, it is always worth considering it, trying to develop relationships with people in the agencies and to get your access that way because um, they usually have a different path, a much easier path. Um, so, you know, I've, my experience is with the Census Bureau, but I know that I people have done similar things with the IRS. I know where if you can, 
understand their work, be interested in it, make yourself useful to them, it can often open doors that are much harder to open by following the externally advertised protocols for access. Um, so yeah, that's, you know, this is something I work with um, Raj Chetty, he, he's an economist who's um, helping with the, the linkage project. And um, I often see people say about Raj that he has access that they don't have, and that's not fair. It's not about fair or unfair. He's put a ton of effort into developing relationships that get him that access and maintaining them. And that means working and making yourself useful and doing things you don't, that aren't interesting to you, but that you know the agency needs. That's how you get it. It's not because you're lucky or someone hands it to you. It's because that's how you choose to use your time. So I would recommend doing that. Okay, anything else? Okay, well, it takes us just up to about 10 after the hour. So Trendle, thank you for staying around for this additional conversation. I'm sure things have been really instructive and helpful. Um, and thank you again for taking the time for your presentation earlier. Sure, yep. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for just hanging around. Okay. Bye. Thanks.